Uh, welcome, panel. Uh, we're here to talk about how to get good people into politics. The overall theme here is about getting good people into politics. Uh, our panel has been directed to talk about incentives and disincentives, uh, and I'd like us to concentrate on incentives. What kind of things can we do, uh, and what kind of things can our institutions do to get good people into politics and encourage them to pursue this uh, uh, vocation of, of politics? Uh, who would like to start? Uh, Rick, do you want to start? I was a national campaign manager a couple of times, 93 and 97, and part of my uh, responsibilities was recruiting candidates right across the country. <clears throat> and it's not, uh, not a very easy thing to do for all the reasons that we've been discussing uh, earlier today and last night. Uh, I think the most important thing we could do on the incentive side of things is to make the job more meaningful. Uh, intelligent people look at parliament, they look at the role of parliamentarians, and they wonder, why would I give up my life to do that? It's not about money. Uh, parliamentarians are, by and large, pretty well paid now. The benefits are pretty good. Uh, you know, if you've got an ego, it's a good job. Uh, so there's all kinds of those sorts of benefits um, <clears throat> that, particularly on the financial side, used to be obstacles, but they're not anymore. Now it's a question of why would I, what would be my opportunity to make a positive contribution? And I think people, if they talk about it and think about it, you know, talk to people who are all already there. Everybody knows that it's very worthwhile in the larger sense of, you know, being part of governing the country or the province or the city. But they wonder, can you actually make a material contribution to that? And that wonderment or that concern, I think, is well placed. Jennifer, you uh, have been a number of occasions have uh, undertaken to become a candidate. Uh, you've been successful in some occasions. In other occasions, you haven't. Uh, how do you see the incentives working uh, in terms of encouraging people like you to get into politics and to keep trying? Well, I think uh, uh, certainly from my experience, and I have participated in seven nomination contests, as I was saying to Doug earlier, five successfully and two not. And I know from reading the exit interviews of the 65 parliamentarians that, uh, whose opinions were aggregated in the Samara report, that nomination, which is the process you have to go through to get onto the ballot, is the first barrier to entry. And I think it is the, was the conclusion of the Samara reporters that that, in fact, that process uh, universally, and this was uh, fr from all of the people who were successful, all 65 were successful, uh, that this is a black box. Uh, the rules are uh, opaque at best, honored in the breach. Uh, often uh, they are unregulated brawls, political brawls. And, and I think that is a disincentive and I think some, a greater clarity uh, in the rules, the application of the rules, understanding of what people are getting into would be an incentive. Because many people, certainly that I've spoken to, who have been recruited by others or I have tried to recruit, will say, I will not participate in political thuggery. I cannot do that. It's not because I can't go out and do the, the, the meeting, the. Uh, people in my constituency and signing them up, it's because of how the rules will change and, and that kind of thing, and the, uh, the risk to my reputation, uh, to my career, to my uh, family's health and welfare and reputation. So I think that would be one thing that would be a better so, incentive. So a fair, more transparent, rules-based system for nominations. I'm going to come back to this because I want to just inquire of the panelists. Uh, who would establish such rules, and do we, are we looking for some authority to step in and, and uh, govern the rules? But first, let's go to Gordon, and Gordon, your response to the question, uh, how do we get good people uh, like yourself, I don't suppose you're uh, attempting to get back in now, but uh, how do we get good people like yourself and others to get into politics? I just write about them now. <laughs> uh, from time to time, people come to me and say, I'm thinking of getting into politics. What do you think I should do? Uh, if they're talking municipal, I say, go for it. You, know, you can do that and still have a life. That's a good idea. Uh, if it's federal, provincial, and I invariably respect these people, I say to them, uh, for the country, for the province, do it. Do it right now. It's, I'm, it's wonderful. I'm a citizen. I'm glad. But now I want to talk about you. And I say, let's pretend this is an ordinary employment deal. Uh, let's talk about the job description compensation and security package, the recruitment process, uh, working conditions, opportunity for advancement, opportunity to do good. And when it's over the exit, 
and, and your retirement prospects. The job description, well, it could be that uh, you should be competent to do the job. It could be that you should be very representative to do the job. In the Citizens' Assembly, that's the way it was. It was a randomly selected package of British Columbians. It was wonderful. Or it could be that the job involves being a foot soldier for the leader. And uh, people always talk about candidates that should be doing one and two, competent and representative. But in fact, they vote in terms of number three. And that's what's going to get you elected. Are you going to be a good foot soldier for a leader? Is that what you want? The recruitment process is, uh, unless you are blessed from above, uh, which, which is not entirely to be despised, um, especially if it's you being blessed, uh, is, uh, is otherwise extremely messy. As Jennifer says, chaotic, often extremely unpleasant. Uh, you, will be, you will be asked to sign up uh, thousands of memberships, often, often against well-organized groups uh, that you can't possibly compete with in, in terms of numbers, be they issue groups, be they ethnic groups, whatever. So it could be very tough. Once you get there, what are the working conditions? Uh, well, they're quite interesting. Um, almost everyone I know that gets into Parliament or the legislature uh, got there because they really wanted to change the world. And you watch them for the first six months and you see the air go out of the balloon. And they come to understand, you know, there's not much I can do here. Uh, this, is a, this is a pretty well-controlled system. Uh, I can maybe slide a little idea through. It might even be a big idea. Remember John Matheson in the, in the flag debate and got a new flag for Canada? That, that, that kind of thing is very rare. Um, so what do you do about this? I, I come back to what Rick said. Empower the ordinary member of parliament. That is what will make this job more attractive. Okay, so we've got a common theme there. We'll probably come back to that. Don, you work, uh, you've been in politics a long time, and I know you do work in getting people, convincing people to run. Uh, what do you see as the kinds of incentives that should be offered or that you can suggest to them are there for them to get into politics? I've spent a lot of years uh, encouraging women to run in politics and uh, trying to uh, encourage women to run uh, for my party, for the New Democratic Party at the federal and the provincial level. And uh, I think some of the perceptions that are out there are, are ones that prevent uh, particularly women from running. But also, I, it's my feeling that women come to this... Uh, uh, decision-making processes in a different way than men and that we need to take that kind of time to uh, work with women and encourage them to be part of the political process. I do want to take a little exception to uh, saying how do we get good people to run. I think that the legislature and the House of Commons is filled with good people. Um, I don't agree with all of them <laughs> and have argued with them vociferously on a number of issues and, and would continue to do that. But the people that I know in the House of Commons and in the legislature all went there with the ideas that Gordon talked about. They want to make a difference. I think the biggest incentive to run is because you do want to make a difference. And I have to disagree somewhat with Gordon because I feel, even though I've never been in government, that I have made a difference. And I celebrate whenever I... Uh, 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 feel that I've been able to uh, affect the debate and affect the outcome of uh, majority governments, minority governments, um, and I wouldn't want to leave an impression here with people today that uh, members of the legislature and members of the uh, uh, House of Commons do not make a difference. They do, in fact, on, on many things make a, a difference. The other issue that's been raised, of course, is nominations, and they can be brutal, and I've had uh, two contested nominations, won them both, um, and uh, the other nominations were uncontested. Clearly, it's the people who understand how the nomination process works who win. It's the people who uh, work hardest at it who win. Now, we can all debate whether those are the good people or not the good people. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that the rules are opaque in, uh, in my political party. I think they're pretty clear about how the nomination process works. That's not to say it's the best process going, but... Um, I think it is a clear and uh, understandable process. Um, let me jump back to this question of uh, making the job more rewarding by making it count. I think we all agree that most people go into politics because they want to make a difference. They want to do something about things they care about. There's been some difference of opinion about whether you can really do that or not. Um, why do those of you who say, uh, you know, that it, being a member of parliament, you, you, you need, to, need to have opportunities to be more effective before people will run, why do you say that, and what do you think actually needs to be done to be fixed? Because we've heard this so long, 
uh, and I've never seen anyone actually go in and fix it. Well, I, I, <clears throat> if I could take a first stab at that, Doug, I, I think we tend to approach this uh, more in terms of its symptoms than its causes. We talk about why is it so partisan, why is it so adversarial, why is, it so, why is there so much bashing, uh, why are we reducing intelligent people to talking to each other through, uh, through uh, dumbed down talking points and 30 second ads and all that kind of stuff. So why does all of that happen? Do we, do we treat these symptoms? Uh, I think it happens because we lack an understanding in Canada uh, of what the role of Parliament actually is. And we've, we've kind of lost our sense of history if we ever actually had it in this country. We tell ourselves that the parliamentary system is supposed to work this way uh, when that's actually not what was conceived to do. It was actually con conceived back in the beginning, in the days of Magna Carta and the English Civil War, if you want to go back hundreds of years in the history of the evolution of our system. Parliament was supposed to be a serious check on the power of the executive, i.e. the cabinet, and the prime minister, and the crown. And it was supposed to actually decide how money, you know, that the crown couldn't spend money, couldn't raise money, or spend money without parliament's approval. Uh, and the crown couldn't make laws without parliament making them, and amending them, or, or rejecting them. And that was the original concept here. We've inverted that to the point where we now expect parliament to do the government's bidding. And particularly, Don, if you're on the government side of the, uh, of the House, of the legislature, uh, you really are truly expected to do the government's bidding. If you read those Samara reports that Jennifer was referring to, you see these, uh, these former MPs, 65 of them, talking about how they had no little, very little understanding of their job. Nobody trained them. Uh, they didn't understand the nomination process for the most part, and they felt it was abused. But they also talk about how they would be handed instructions by their party's whips and told how they were going to vote on issue after issue after issue. And they had done no homework. They were expected to do no homework. They were expected to have no dissent. Uh, they were expected to just do the leader's bidding or the whip's bidding. And, uh, you know, I don't understand why we don't just have four people in Parliament, the, the four leaders who can just kind of have these debates with each other. We don't need the other 306 but if do, that's the way it's going to work. Do, uh, do potential candidates, the ones we want to get started who haven't had this experience, do they know that? And do they fear politics or resist politics because they believe they won't be able to make a difference uh, in Parliament or in the legislature? Jim? I think some do. And, and to take that a little further, I think that can apply to provincial legislatures. And I very much take your point, which is it's, uh, to expand on that point. It's the rise of the power of the executive, the growth of... of uh, unappointed political appointees in larger and larger premiers and, and uh, uh, PMOs, prime ministers' offices, who often are the people who are making the policy and then the legislators are told what to do. So I think that is a disincentive, and I agree, to get to your incentive question, uh, that giving more power to committees, uh, to giving uh, more and to... Uh, to build upon a point made this morning, that certainly confidence votes, of course, you have to support your, your government, your party, what have you, um, and that would be budget and some other uh, major platform initiatives, whether it was a different way of dealing with our Aboriginal peoples or not. But there are a whole lot of ish other issues, and there can be good input and good use put to uh, whether they're legislators or parliamentarians. And before we leave that, I want to make a plug for um, local government municipal life, because I think you are much more unfettered there. Even if you do get elected with a, a group of people of similar philosophy, I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity to exercise your judgment and to represent your voters in a different kind of way than there is under the parliamentary Okay, system. parliamentary reform, uh, reform of nominations. Uh, just before we go to the next question, I want to remind everyone, you can tweet. You can text, you've got the instructions to do that. We're going to have some uh, questions from the tweet and text uh, desk in just a second, but I'm Don, you want to? I'm just a little just bit a, concerned yeah. about this uh, emphasis on the lack of partisanship that is being promoted throughout the day, actually. And I understand that, and I understand that the system in, uh, in Westminster, in, in the House of Commons in, uh, in um, Britain is, is, is less uh, um, structured in, in the way of party discipline, and I think that's a good thing, and I think that's something we could look to in Canada. However, I don't think I want to see a situation where you do not run under political parties, that you do not run under a banner of a platform and policies, and I want to give one example. I was in the House of Commons when the Supreme Court of Canada uh, 
throughout the law on reproductive freedom and abortion. And my political party had a policy on, on, on abortion and reproductive rights for women, and the other parties didn't. And um, I was the person who was responsible for that issue in, in, in uh, my party. I was the critic. And so uh, debating and, and discussing in caucus, and there were a couple of members who were uncomfortable with the party policy um, and who would have probably liked to have voted with the government to recriminalize abortion services. They were restrained from doing that, it's true, because there was a party policy on the issue and because when they decided to run with the New Democratic Party, they undertook to, to support those policies. So, uh, you know, if, if, if we want to talk about a less partisanship, I, I understand that, and more freedom on votes, but on specific issues of substance, uh, I think Mike talked earlier about uh, Aboriginal, uh, uh, progress on Aboriginal rights. Um, on those issues, I would be very uneasy to be part of a political party that was loosey-goosey on, on fundamental issues like that. And, I'm, and the last thing I want to say is I have never felt restrained in my many years of politics from speaking out. I have never felt uh, forced to vote in any particular way that I wasn't comfortable with. And in fact, I would never do that. Thank you, Don. So a defense of, uh, of some parts of the system, at least, in saying, look, we can only go so far with uh, parliamentary reform and reform of parties uh, before we'd be stepping outside the institutional structure and, and system that we have. Uh, Gordon, did you have a quick comment? Uh, and then I'm going to go over to the tweet desk. Just a, just a couple. I, I agree with Don about the, uh, the relative freedom in the British House of Commons. There's a very good reason for that. There's 650 MPs. Most of them know they have no chance at all of being a cabinet minister, so therefore they have more, no, more, more freedom. Aboriginal issues, uh, the current system doesn't work for us. Politicians are not allowed to think outside the box on Aboriginal issues because the parties don't allow that. Uh, there's, there's just too much conventional wisdom and we have, we have on, 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 ongoing misery. We, we really need, need more. And, and Doug, you said, why aren't things fixed? The reason things aren't fixed is because the system uh, uh, mitigates in favor of win-lose rather than win-win. And because for the first ministers, the system works wonderfully well, and they are the gatekeepers to reform. Okay. Uh, do we have, uh, uh, from the tweet or text desk, do we have uh, any questions? A question. One is specifically about whether they believe, uh, whether our panelists believe that the recruitment of female candidates requires a different approach than the recruitment of male candidates. And in a different vein, and uh, if you can remember to get around to it when you're done, we have a question from the tweet desk that asks, should party leaders be decided by party members or by caucus? Okay, so going, should we go back to the old system or not, but we'll leave that for now. Uh, the, the question with respect to women, a very important question, uh, how do we get more diversity and how do we we create incentives for women to participate who are so badly underrepresented in our legislatures, our municipal councils, uh, not so much maybe our municipal councils, yeah, but our legislatures yeah. and our parliament. Yeah. Uh, currently, the uh, percentage of women in the BC legislature, I think, is verging on 30%, so we've made some progress there, although that's, that's not great. I mean, women are the majority in Canada. They not, they we're, we're not a minority. And in Ottawa, I think the percentage is around 23 or 24% of uh, female uh, members of parliament. So we're, we're not making progress uh, the way that we should make progress. And yes, we absolutely need to look at uh, 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 different ways of encouraging women to run. Um, I've done a lot of it over the years, and I know it takes uh, more time. Women uh, don't often. I never thought I'd be in politics. I never, ever dreamt that I would run for, for uh, parliament, ever. And it took an evolution of, of, of uh, my life and the things that I was involved in that led me to, uh, to eventually run for elected office. Um, when we look at where countries have been successful in, uh, in the numbers of women in their, in their legislatures and parliaments, it's uh, mostly the Nordic countries and new democracies where they have a system of proportional representation, where the party lists are uh, done so that there is a, 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 most of them say, a floor of 40% of either gender. It means you could have 60% women, but they don't often do that. And uh, that's where, where we've seen the uh, more equal uh, representation of men and women. And I would say, unless we have parliaments and legislatures in Canada that truly reflect the Canadian population, we're really missing out on an active and vibrant democracy. Thank you. So this panel is focusing on incentives. Uh, we think of getting more women candidates. Panelists, do you favor 
uh, special incentives, targeted incentives for women to run, including financial and other things? Do you favor quotas or re uh, reserve nominations? These are incentives. What do you think? Uh, 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 one, uh, the first thing I think is in terms of, of recruiting women, uh, many women self-select themselves out for, for reasons that have been stated before, family considerations, um, spousal uh, uh, career situations, and the risk to, again, reputation, family, finances, those kinds of things. Um, many, mo most need to be asked. Uh, they don't step up to the plate, although men are more likely to do that. Um, I think the Women's Campaign School in this province has done a good job of at least trying to train some women to to know what the issues are and what are the, the uh, things that they're going to run into so that they don't approach this without uh, education. I think where there have been appointments tried, and I look at the 2005 provincial election in this province, all of the women who were not incumbents, who were not incumbents for the BC Liberal Party were appointed and none of them ran for the second term but one. And I think without getting into a whole lot of detail, I think it again goes back to perhaps your, your uh, point that you opened up with, Rick, is if I'm going to get into this highly combative arena, which I'm not necessarily all that comfortable with, and which I think is not as productive use of my time as other places might be, um, do I want, do, can I make a difference? Or am I going to be essentially a, a trained seal or have very little room to, within which to, to move, which may satisfy you, Don, but doesn't satisfy a lot of other candidates? Okay, can I, uh, I want to ask uh, Rick and Gordon to comment on this. Uh, keep, let's keep our comments as short as we can because we have a lot of questions to go through and a lot of topics to cover. Uh, well, for sure, uh, the, to answer the question, for sure I think we have to uh, come up with a different way of recruiting women into politics. Uh, and approach them differently. Um, even though our one side of our political correctness says we shouldn't distinguish between people, the other knows that they're not the same. Uh, and so we have to find better ways of doing that. I think, again, uh, part of it is improving the workspace, making it more meaningful, uh, but also less mean. Uh, you know, the name calling that goes on in politics, the, uh, the rude remarks, you watch what's going on these days uh, in the Federal House of Commons, um, which has been going on for years now. Um, you, you know, I mean, Ignatieff, not here for you. Uh, think of the things they say about Stephen Harper. There are a lot of people, uh, and I think more often women than men, but a lot of men too, who just aren't interested in going into that kind of arena. And I think we have to clean up the workspace. Mm -hmm. Gordon? Yeah. When we put together the Citizens' Assembly, the fundamental rule of composition was there has to be one man for every woman and vice versa. Yep. It was equally balanced. Equal. That, uh, that we found in surveys greatly increased the respect of the Assembly in the province. And it also changed the way that that deliberative body worked. Uh, the, the Carol and Mike show this morning was, was, was very interesting. Uh, one, one, was, one version of politics was the win-lose. Yeah. The other was the win-win. Uh, when you get more women around, you get more win-win stuff, I believe. And, 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 and I'm gradually coming to believe that we ought to have a, 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 a structural, I hate the word quota, but we, we, we need to have a, a, a structural uh, engagement of, of gender. I want the record to show that Gordon's going to lead the charge for the quota base 50-50 parity in the, in the Parliament, and I support you in that. Okay, we have a question from the floor. Hi, this one's mostly for uh, Mr. Gibson, who previously spoke on municipal politics. I'm from North Vancouver, where last Saturday, of the two North Vancouver City and District Councils, uh, the new uh, the new councils represent 12 out of 14 incumbents. Number 13 is the former MP, and number 14 is a school trustee who successfully made the jump to the city council. So my question is basically, the whole thing seems to come down to name recognition. And how does, I, I really do think that at this time, we are at the local level losing a lot of good candidates simply because the power of incumbency is so massively strong. How does one get past that? Okay, this is, uh, this is particularly, I think, uh, an issue, incumbency at the municipal level. Jennifer, you have a lot of experience there. Uh, that, that's true. Uh, incumbency, I think all across the board, an incumbent has an advantage. 
Uh, obviously, they're, which party they're affiliated with on the provincial or federal level may have, make a difference. And it may also, at a civic level, if there are political civic organizations that are behind one group or another, um, unfortunately, that those are, are truths. But there's a way to advance that, and that is at the municipal level, because it's a smaller arena, you can get in, uh, involved as a citizen activist, you can get involved in your local park and recreation commission, you can get involved in a local specific issue groups, you can be involved in the school board level, and like that one candidate, make the transition and then become an incumbent yourself, and hopefully do a good job. Certainly in Vancouver, where I have served, we've seen uh, groups of people come in and out depending on how the electors think the job is being done. Do you think incumbency is a, a, a problem uh, in terms of affecting uh, the uh, willingness of people to run when they see incumbents keep winning at the I, local level? I don't level? really think it's a problem. Uh, incumbents tend to have more, more knowledge than, than the new people and offended if they're not doing a, a good job. The incumbency means that people know about it. On the other hand, to re reiterate what Jennifer said, there is actually change. Vision Van Kiver came in and changed everything. Team came in and changed everything. In West Vancouver, Pam's the expert, but I think there are two or three new faces in the, in the last election there. I don't know much about North Vancouver. I'm sorry, question. So new people are getting in. What about uh, federally and provincially? Do you think incumbency is, a, is an issue, or is it, is, is it really a non-issue, as we've kind of implied by saying it's a municipal problem? I think it's a factor. I think it's a factor in, in all elections, but... Uh, 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 the last study I looked at uh, about candidates at the, I think it was the federal level, uh, it showed that name recognition or the candidate in, in, uh, in an election only made maybe 2 to 5% difference in uh, whether they were elected or, or not. So as much as people here want to think that uh, we're not a partisan nation, we are a partisan nation, and most people still continue to is vote by party. A, is incumbency a problem in a different way? Those, those MLAs and those MPs who won't give up their seat, who won't step aside, they've been around, oh. and they're incumbents, they stay there, and new candidate, a new person can't break in because they're holding on. Is that a problem? I think mm -hmm. Don's right. It's not a problem in, by the time you get to the general election where people are actually voting for the leader and the party. Unfortunately, they should be paying more attention to the local candidate, actually. Yeah. Uh, but, it, it, but incumbency isn't really that a problem in that regard. But it is a problem with the nomination process. And uh, this goes again to the recruitment of women, but also other clear-thinking people. Uh, women, I generally include women in clear thinking, uh, but I, so I'm subsetting men that way. Um, you know, uh, the nomination processes are basically UFC rules, uh, and I, I'm glad your I'm glad your experience has been so positive. But you know, I, there are lots of people who know stories of you know hearing that the nomination has been called today for tomorrow, you know, or for two weeks from now plus one day, so the cutoff for new members is tomorrow. Uh, and you know, we've even got parties, national parties couple of them highly respected parties, one of them the government, that actually decides when it's going to bother with the nomination process at the local level. They give a free pass to incumbents. So I think those are unhealthy tendencies. I don't think that, that the leaders should have anything to do with who gets to be nominated at the local level. I don't think the parties should be able to, um, to pull back nominations. And I don't think that the parties should administer that process because they've proven to be incapable of doing it fairly. Thank you. Question from the floor. Oh, hi, my name is Ian Bruce. Um, one question, uh, I guess we've heard a lot about damage to reputation. People not going into politics because of concern um, that be, their reputation will be damaged by either media or other political parties. My question is, you know, what solutions would help uh, cl clean up that, those issues so that more people could, uh, would be encouraged to go into politics? Um, one thing that concerns me, just for an example, uh, in the U.S., we've certainly seen a lot more uh, problems with media uh, um, reporting on things that aren't factual. And I would take an ex one example on the left or the right, it wouldn't matter, but, but Fox News, for example, has been criticized a lot for its interventions. Um, uh, you know, we have an, uh, an auditor general for looking after accountability of government. Would, do we need an auditor to look after media in, in Canada? Is that something <laughs> we could use? <laughs> Virginia, are you ready to step in and put an auditor down uh, over the top of the media in, no, uh, in Canada? Not at all. That's but I <laughs> that would be called a censor, al although I chuckle, um, and I'm sure I'll get some pushback and, and, and welcome to it, uh, that uh, I've been a Webster Journalism Award judge and uh, happy to do it and, and um, awarded uh, fine reporting. 
and uh, feature stuff, but it would be, it, you know, sometimes you want to have a blooper kind of thing. It was some of the kinds of uh, reporting that gets done that's not so good. Um, you know, I, I think uh, that was well covered by the previous panel, but I think the issue of damage to reputation is real. I think for women in particular, um, I, I thought uh, Pam's story was cute about the person who at the, uh, I think it was the dry cleaning um, the store who said you look fat on TV. I was always told that I, they were sh uh, surprised at how short I was. Um, uh, the media variously called me during my political career um, too pretty, too smart, too well educated, too strong, um, too, you know, name it all. Um, and I think that my labels were head girl and Lady Macbeth. I want the women in this room to put up their hands if they would like to run for public office and find themselves with that kind of name calling. Anybody volunteering for that? So, and I think that applies to men as well, different labels, but I think that's something that media can be um, uh, more careful about. I think I was also called a hussy in a red dress at one point, and I love red, but I don't think hussy goes with, you know, some of these other things. So I, I think there can be uh, ways in which people are characterized that dissuades them from entering the arena because they think about the damage to their families, their um, partners, their, um, uh, the issues that they were uh, trying to champion, and their future um, reputations in the community and employment prospects. Gordon, are the things that are being said by other politicians in the media about people personally driving people away from politics, and if so, what could we do about it? The only people who can do anything about this is the people themselves. Uh, they have to become more tolerant if they choose to be. As was said in another panel this morning, nobody's perfect. Yeah. And uh, maybe, maybe somebody had a drunk driving uh, conviction, maybe, maybe somebody had a messy divorce. Uh, these things happen all the time. Uh, and if the people say, well, we're going to rule out everybody with this kind of background, then, you, then you're going to get what you get. It's also a question of, of the level of public tolerance. The, the media is not going to back off, and even if the media does, social media is more than willing to anonymously crucify virtually anyone in this world right. today. Well, I, the reputation—I think reputation is the wrong word. You know, in, uh, if you think about people who used to be in politics, their reputations actually recover quite quickly. Uh, you know, and we end up uh, respecting them. I'm not singling out. Uh, Premier Harcourt here, but you know, my friend Preston Manning, uh, you know, you go on pretty quickly to be regarded as a statesman uh, in, uh, in your post-political. That's the good news for aspiring political people. It's when you're in the business that it's actually kind of tough. And uh, I think the lack of civility is the way I would put it. I mean, I don't agree with uh, President Obama on, on many issues, but what I really like about him is the civility and the reasonableness he brings to the public space. And when he talks about an issue or talks about his opponents, he tends to do it with a respect for the substance and a respect for the person. And I think we need to, and he's done pretty, pretty well uh, with that kind of signature. And I think we need to figure out, you talk about incentives, Doug, we need to figure out how to change the incentives so we're rewarding more people who are doing that and conducting themselves that way rather than the loud melts and the, uh, and the Molotov cocktail throwers who, you know, as Fizeau was saying, we cover plane crashes, not plane landings. What a great line. Um, you know, in politics, we cover people who create controversy as opposed to people who advance issues. And uh, we've got to somehow figure out how to get that back onto the right, uh, on the right planet. Uh, you could uh, uh, tweet Pat Martin and ask him how you get attention to the closure on budget bills and what's the best technique, but I'll leave it there. Don, what do you I think? I retweeted Pat's tweet. <laughs> you know, I said, bad lingo, but right idea. He's right about that. The government's using time allocation too much. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and lots of people around the federal parliament have been talking about that, but guess who gets the attention? Some guy who swears about it. You know, what, what's wrong with us that that's what it takes to pay attention to something like that? Don. Yeah. Sorry. When you were, were speaking, Rick, it uh, made me think of many of uh, the colleagues that I've known politically in the House of Commons and in the BC legislature who uh, work very diligently, make a big difference to the lives of British Columbians, make a big difference to the lives of uh, Canadians as well, but who are not media stars, who are not noticed particularly by the media, 
Um, and uh, those people uh, really do <laughs> uh, accomplish a lot for Canadians, but I'm not sure many people know about it. So the, 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 the relationship between the press and, and politicians is a symbiotic relationship, but they don't always cover the people who are, or, or who are working very hard on, at a committee level of a bill, making uh, amendments to that bill and making it stronger. Uh, that doesn't get covered in any way, shape, or form. But when we get back to incentives, Doug, I think the biggest incentive to people in political life is the opportunity to make a difference. And that's certainly what drove me to politics, and I think it's what, what drives the majority of, of people to politics. And I, I, I don't want to do a disservice here today and let people think that politicians don't make a difference in your lives. All politicians from this, all political parties. Aren't these figures we heard, the problem of how the, dis, the level of respect dropping for politicians is for so low. When I, when I ran a, I loved, I, I loved everything about politics. I heard these complaints. I loved the nomination process. I loved being an MLA. I loved being a minister. I loved the whole thing. Uh, and I thought it was a good experience. But my, uh, my, the friends of my kids and so on, they don't think that about politics at all. They, they think it's, it's, it's a, it, 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 all of this stuff we're talking about. It's frustrating, it's a dirty business. It's, uh, and you know, I, I teach university and all the faculty talk with disrespect about politicians. It's just trashing politicians all the time. I'm shocked by this. I only re, you know, came recent, uh, more recently to the job. What's going on here and how can we change this thing about civility and attitudes towards the, uh, uh, the idea of politics? Well, that's a very profound question. <laughs> That's a really profound question. But I think one of the Go things ahead. that have been, has been mentioned a couple of times, and I think Anne said it well, and I think it was during the break, wherever Anne is, um, is you know, the, uh, if you reward uh, the, the kind of behavior that you want to see. And I think if you, there's reward for civility, um, and that can be in, it can be frankly the media. Instead of encouraging, um, you know, whatever it is, bashing, name calling, whatever it is, the kind of thoughtful person that you're talking about, of which all of us who've served in public life, whether they're civil servants or they are elected people, have, you know, there are lots of good people like that. Good. Jerry? Doug, I think there's a short answer to your question. Yep. Empower the ordinary MLA or MP. So we come back to parliamentary reform. Mm -hmm. Don? In the 90s, uh, when I was in the House of Commons, we had a uh, all-women's committee of uh, nonpartisan members mm -hmm. of parliament from all the different political parties. And we made representation to the speaker of the day about some changes. It came about after a, a particularly nasty day in, in the House of Commons when uh, I was called a fishwife. Uh, Sheila Copps uh, was uh, nobody's right. baby uh, before that, <laughs> Tequila <laughs> Sheila or something, and um, another black member of parliament was called actually Sambo in the House of Commons that hurled across the floor. Um, and so we took that, that group of women and we met with the speaker and we were making progress actually on some, uh, some uh, uh, changes to the rules of the House of Commons when the election came in and it all went down the tubes, but you can do things from within the system to affect change. Okay, we've got to move along. Are there, uh, is there something from the tweet desk or the text desk? We do. We have a great question here from Becca, who is the organizer of this fine event. Uh, and it relates actually to what we've been talking about, both about uh, incentives for getting into politics, so avenues of politics, but also people's feelings about politics and politicians. And she asks, what are your thoughts on participatory mechanisms that are becoming more common around the globe? As an example, she offers the BC Citizens Assembly. Do you think deliberative democracy can help relieve some of the apathy people feel towards representative democracy, or would it be at odds with it? Well, it would be uh, probably uh, unfair to give Gordon the first uh, chance to, uh, to speak to this, so I'll, I'll turn first to Rick and ask him what he thinks about this. Uh, as, a, as a proposition? Well, surely Gordon's answer is just yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, our experiences with deliberative democracy in Canada, although not very common, uh, are basically pretty positive. And, uh, and it's strange because we don't regard them as being positive. We regard the Charlottetown referendum as a disaster. But it wasn't a disaster. The world went on. The public expressed itself. The politicians were reined in. You've had an experience here in this province uh, with the HST. I mean, it's, you know, we could debate whether that was the right <laughs> policy outcome at the end of the day or not. But the point is people felt a certain way about how things have been done, and they got an opportunity to assert themselves. Uh, and that's a warning shot for, uh, for political people. I'm sure 100% of the political people who witnessed that uh, took a lesson from it. 
Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think the deliberative democracy is a, is a good thing, used uh, appropriately. Uh, some jurisdictions famously overuse it and have hamstrung themselves completely and they can't actually govern anymore. Um, you know, thinking about California, uh, for one. Uh, but, uh, you know, our problem in Canada is frequently when we start to look at good ideas, we imagine them in their extreme application and we then get afraid of that so we don't do anything. Uh, and, you know, a little bit of it is probably healthy and we could probably do more in Canada in this direction than we have. Good. Uh, I don't no. think anybody would disagree with more citizen involvement being a, good, a bad idea. I mean, it's a good idea and, and we need to find that balance that Rick is talking about that allows uh, government and, uh, and legislatures to achieve uh, uh, progress. Uh, and, and balance that along with the citizen involvement. There are ways for citizens to be involved now in terms of uh, committee work. Citizens are invited to committees in, uh, in legislatures and, and in parliaments to make representation. And often it's not uh, well known and it's not well advertised and, and, and not encouraged as much as it could be. I don't know whether it would be inappropriate for me to pitch my recent article on policy options in defense of the referendum in BC, but I ask you, to, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Gordon. Uh, well, yes, I'm in favor of participatory <laughs> democracy. Yes, indeed. yes is the answer. Virginia? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, of course, but uh, I, there are other ways, as, as I think Don's alluded to, uh, for other kinds of participation. And what I uh, think the uh, electronic age has brought us is instead of just those people who feel comfortable standing at a microphone or sitting here, uh, there are other ways to contribute online and various kinds of uh, mechanisms that I think is great. Uh, but you eventually, it, it is the politicians eventually who have to make the decision. Okay, thank you very much. Our time is up. I think we'd love to have a conference on this uh, as opposed to a 45-minute panel, but I thank you, panel. I think you've done a great job in uh, probing into this question and uh, looking at these questions and uh, a, lot for, a lot to think about from what we've heard here. Thank you very much. Thank you.